Okay, so um, let's, um, I will, since we have young people in Rob, I will refrain from my normal uh, flowery speech. <laughs> in general, I will refrain. But just note, this is very important to note, I've been a, I'm, this used to be my depression era of the year. This used to be the time of panic attacks and one of the three nervous breakdowns I've had in the last 25 years, and all of that's gone, so you know, none of that's gonna happen today. But, um, but, what, but now that all of that energy has been focused into this direction, this part of the year is mostly a kind of dream state for at least three months of the year. So that is just a disclaimer. <laughs> to let you know that we are going, I, I've kind of been playing with some ideas in the last three months that are strange, and we're going all the way in. So, if there is no pre, I have no pre-made, it's just a field of weirdness that uh, I'm going to drop on you. And at any point, be not, not only feel free to interrupt and ask a question or to ask for a clarification or what did you mean by that? Because I make up a lot of words or I use words that mean one thing to express something else. And I like conversation and I love debate even more. <laughs> so just note that there will be points where you will probably be like, what? And feel free at that exact moment to just be like, yo, wait a minute, and we can go there. Is that cool? All right. So with that, as a, as a precursor, I've been uh, contemplating a bit what is, um, you know, what is music, and also really kind of exploring what is this moment that we're having, right? You know, um, we're, all, we're all machine people. We were all born into the machine. We emote to machine music. We communicate through machine means and networks, right? So what is all of that in a context that makes sense now and not necessarily how it makes sense, how it might have made sense to someone 20 years ago, or 50 years ago, or many of the theorists that I've gotten a chance to study online, uh, namely Sun Ra, Terrence McKenna, mm -hmm. Marshall McLuhan. So you'll hear, so if you know any of those individuals, you will hear a lot of resonant ideas that I want to twist a bit, right? So, let me see. How do I want to start? I, okay, you know what? I'm just going to jump straight into the thing. Mm -hmm. about, a, about three months ago, I realized that to be able to deal with the era that we're in, what I call the era of absurdity, <laughs> that's where we're at now. You know, it's like, think about it. The internet pops up. And out of the internet pops all kinds of things that we either thought would never happen or, uh, or didn't just, e or even had an idea would happen. Like um, back in the 90s, a black president was like a myth that was good in the movies, right? But it's like no one ever thought it would actually happen, right? Then all of a sudden, boom, now that's history, mm. right? And now we've got a reality TV show star. <laughs> you know, 15 years ago, there was a movie called Idiocracy that, that posited this. And that was supposed to be 300 years into the future. But yet, here we are, and we have that, right? So that sets up the context, the context that it doesn't get any less strange going forward. <laughs> it's not going to get less weird. So. I needed to figure out a way in my own mind, how do I contextualize what this is? 
and tie it into a digital signal processing wearable prosthesis. Mm -hmm. I just let that hang in the air for a second. <laughs> All right. So, I designed a belief construct. I've been waiting to drop this on people for a second. I've been testing it on friends of mine and uh, just to see. You know, I've got a lot of friends that are like super religious, things like that. This is a belief construct. It's not a belief system. It's completely a programmable thing. It's, it's super simple, it's skeletal, and it ties directly into the type of synthesis and why that synthesis is relevant. Everybody still with me? Okay, if anybody needs a sleep break or something at any point, let me know. All right, so I'm gonna drop it on you. I'm just gonna go through it, because it's brief, and then I'll ask if, if, any, of, if any of that is um, anything you wanna remark on, and then we, then we can kind of go on to some of the other stuff, okay? All right, so, okay, so this is the Metabit belief construct. Metabit is the binary logic that I use for this system. Right? And I'll explain exactly what this is and why it is after that. So, at the absolute core of all, there is, um, is the possibility matrix. It's the simultaneity of all possible states. All possible states in any multiverse, universe, any conceptualization of anything exist in this possibility this simultaneity, but because, uh, let me, oh wait, let me make sure I get it right because if I read it too fast or start jumping ahead, it, it loses stuff. Within this matrix is an inherent mathematically expressed urge, a polarity, mm -hmm. a primary polarity. On one end of the polarity is the, um, is moving towards novelty concrescence, the what if, right? And on the other end, okay, I just unplugged that. Whatever. And on the other end is conservation, conserving novelty, mm. right? So the, ex the urge towards novelty, and urge is a word that I'll use a lot, the urge towards novelty and the urge to conservation of novelty. That is the ability to have a memory of complexity so that more complexity can be built on top of it, right? So, and like I said, a lot of this is stuff you've probably heard in other things, but I just made it into a nice simple construct that gives me a reference point for pretty much everything. Okay, so um, within this matrix is an inherent mathematically expressed urge for novelty concrescence and novelty conservation forming the primary polarity upon which all later polarities are based. Space-time exists as a dimension where possibility in this possibility matrix can be collapsed down, I mean, can be funneled into time, right? And collapsed down to experience, which must necessarily be encoded into a memory matrix dimension, allowing possibility to be expressed and conserved as temporal trajectory record. Mm. <laughs> okay. Space-time exists as a dimension where possibility from the possibility matrix, right, can be funneled into time and collapsed down into experience, which must necessarily be encoded into a memory matrix dimension, allowing possibility to be expressed and conserved as temporal trajectory record, which means that all of that novelty expresses itself over time as complexity, and complexity builds on more complexity. And complexity has, there has to be a memory matrix dimension or we wouldn't be here. Mm. We wouldn't have memories, we wouldn't have us. There would be no planets, there would be no nothing because no, uh, no complexity could be conserved. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, the duality of self is a polarity between the space-time interface, this. This is for traversing space-time. 
sight, hearing, touch, taste, all of these are space-time interface modalities, right? Uh, and so let's call that self with a little s. And then the possibility matrix interface. The zero point where, pos where the possibility matrix collapses down to a corporation of urges <laughs> called the self with a big S. Right? The conduit between the possibility matrix self and the space-time self is intuition. Mm. And within this polarity, this is the part I like the most, within this polarity, there is a programmable temporal quantum mm. buffer mm. called a mind. It's completely programmable. Meaning that, or put another way, there is absolutely nothing that a human can't believe. It doesn't matter how grand or how ridiculous. <laughs> Humans can believe anything. Looked at pathologically, that's a bad thing. Looked at through the lens of, of, of novelty, seeking to express itself by using, by being, by us being this space-time interface for funneling memory into this memory matrix, then it becomes this buffer where it becomes a kind of membrane through which space-time can flow. And that's the self. Hmm? That's the mind. That's the mind, okay. Right? And so, you, so, I, so I, I, I think of it as, because I, I keep doing this when I say uh, higher self, and I think that's kind of a religious metaphor of a higher, a heaven. I'm not, I'm not going there. I'm not anywhere near that. I'm thinking of it more like string theory, that everything kind of emerges from this center point and is a projection. So there's just greater projections of, you know, from this, from this core thing up to like string theory ideas up to like, you know, all your uh, bosons and subatomic stuff and all of that, right? And then it kind of projects out into us and then we project out through uh, our experiences and technology and then that projects out into solar systems and blah, 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 right? Okay. So everybody's still on the same page with me, right? All right. So um, the purpose of mind is to focus novelty into space-time while simultaneously encoding that experience into the memory matrix dimension, which then forms the basis of new complexity. That's it. That's the whole thing, okay. right? Skeletal, so that it can be, I can adapt it over time, it can be, it can be built up. Now, if the mind is this quantum temporal buffer, and that's an abstraction mm. made of words, mm. right? If that is, um, as this is an abstraction, when you start getting into the physiological and the electromagnetic, then sound comes into play. Mm. Because in addition to being this um, kind of space-time knot that we are, we are also inordinately sophisticated in the realms of sound creation. So much so that nothing else can do what we do with our voices. Maybe a parakeet can say a word or two, but it's not gonna be Luther Vandross, <laughs> right? So we are, so at, it, it's, it is spoken to me in such a way, the idea has spoken to me, there's an idea dimension too, but we might jump into that later. But it speaks to me in such a way that it says that maybe the whole point of all of this, or not the point, but the way that we should be encoding space-time is in cymatic patterns, psychocymatic patterns, and actual psychocymatic meaning a perceptual pattern of order in sound, like music. And, of course, cymatics, the actual physical, you know, the physical uh, impression of sound, right? So, thinking about it over the last few months, it makes me think that 
we talk about music being the universal language, right? But the syntax that we use, especially in the West, is this linearization of sound done with this kind of, um, things linearize based on this kind of symbolic logic, right? When you look at the alphabet, for instance, the alphabet, this is based on, you know, just basically just vegging out on Marshall McLuhan speeches for <laughs> months, right? Just really internalizing what he was trying to say because back then in the 50s and 60s when he was saying this stuff, nobody could understand what he was talking about. But now that we're embedded in such a matrix that he was describing that was nascent and he was describing it in relation to television, we are embedded in it. We were born into it. So it makes a lot more sense now, but it still took a bunch of months to really think about. <laughs> that the Western language, the, uh, the, the, the English in particular, as differentiated from many other older languages, the letters don't actually mean anything. Mm -hmm. The word cat does not depend on C, meaning something feline. Mm -hmm. They are all, they, that concatenated together forms the word cat and then you give it meaning. Mm -hmm. So it's a programming language, right? Mm -hmm. So what's interesting is that in that language, or in the alphabet, the alphabet has embedded Fibonacci sequences built into it. Mm -hmm. right? Check this out. If you take the vowels of the English alphabet, A, E, I, O, U. Now, who, do, you, do you all know what fib, uh, Fibonacci sequence is? Who doesn't? Okay, the Fibonacci sequence is kind of the, the math of nature. This is how nature propagates itself. You take an interval, and then you add it to the previous interval that you are measuring. So let's say you start with zero. And zero, zero is zero. Zero and one is one. One and one is two. Two and one, or right, let's go one and two. If I start jumping back that like that, it'll give me a headache. Uh, one and two is three. 2 and 3 is 5, 3 and 5 is 8, 5 and 8 is 13, 8 and 13 is 21, 34, and you keep going on, you keep going up, and it keeps getting bigger and bigger, and it keeps building these, these larger numeric structures, right? Now, the alphabet, there are five vowels. So anytime you see these, these sequence of numbers, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, numbers like that, if you look, you'll probably find that there's a, that there, there's a Fibonacci um, sequence in there and that's you know that represents that either it's naturally occurring or it was constructed for, for a purpose the alphabet has five vowels a e i o u in between the a and the e are three letters in between e and i is three letters mm. in between i and o is five letters o and u is five letters and what's interesting is that between u and the end of the alphabet is five letters also, all vowels fall on odd numbers, which, mm -hmm. I don't know, I just found that very interesting as well, right? Mm -hmm. So, what you have is a sequence that's the five vowels, and you've got two sets of three, and three sets of five, mm -hmm. right? The chances that you have this concatenate, or this, uh, this construction of symbols randomly is almost zero in my mind. I choose to believe that. Like I said, we can believe anything. So that's just something I choose to believe until it becomes a detriment, which it hasn't yet. Right? So what's interesting is that, and I wanted to play it today because, but um, I screwed something up, so I won't be able to actually play it. Maybe I'll get it working before the concert, because I have it. I have the sequence, but I, took the, the vowels and put them into a pentatonic, they're a perfect mathematical pentatonic, mm. right? So just taking, say, the value, and I split everything in eight hertz intervals because everything I read, it just seems like everything kind of comes back to eight hertz, or, or eight, um, eight hertz intervals as these, you know, all these sacred geometry 
blah de blah stuff that, you know, all of this comes from the internet. So I'm, I didn't go to school for any of this stuff. I'm just studying this off the internet and using pure data to uh, reinforce my own theories until someone calls me on it and can produce something that's more interesting to me than the stuff that I'm producing for myself. So I'm not saying any of this is true. I'm saying that this is how I've interpreted the internet and, and this comes from the internet as well, from the RefWrap 3D printer and oh. just asking more um, smaller and smaller questions so the questions get more fractal to the degree that they pop out of the internet and onto my hands. So you design your own 3D printer as well? Oh yes. Oh, yeah, I'm, going in, I'm going into that, but I wanted to kind of lay this okay. weird groundwork first so that this makes more sense. Okay, yeah. Because the, um, when you take those, when you, when you have, um, when you have the, 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 these vowels differentiated in, um, as perfect fits, they form a perfect chord. So this is, this is perfect fifths, but with pulses. I used pulses because if this construction that I mentioned earlier, this possibility matrix, is based on polarities, then everything is a, a kind of back and forth pulsing kind of a thing with a spectrum of range between the pulses. Mm. They can be fast pulses, they can be short pulses, um, you can have all kinds of pulse width modulation, metaphors, whatever, right? So, this. While I'm reconnecting the right hand, if anybody has a comment or a question, feel free. This is a very good time to drop that. Does it make sense? Is it just weird? Do I just seem? I just think so. Yes. Yeah. Is it, you know? I think I know. I, I think. <coughs> you know. I like the <coughs> your opening lines about we are like. Machine human, anyway. That that to 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 jump ahead a little bit, just to kind of let you know that this all that I'm not just rambling. Uh, I ramble, but I'm not rambling right, right. right now. Is that if you, when when you, when I think of psychocymatics in relation to people who are born into a machine culture, then there is a thing that uh, this is drifting towards that I call beat linguistics, that we have already trained our minds to understand electronic musical uh, structure and uh, you know, differentiation of form. You know, whether that's uh, temporal differentiation you know, with rhythm, or timbral differentiation, or uh, harmonic differentiation, melodic differentiation, and all of those can have a very specific binary um, can be encoded as very specific binary logic that a computer can understand. But that's jumping ahead a bit. Let me just get this back working. OK, so. Okay, so like I said. just intervals, um, the integer intervals relating to one another. Very small ones. I could make that sound like continuous tones. But when they relate to each other. And also, in this sound, there is the 
because this is built to be fractal. This is part of what I call a sonic fractal matrix. And so this is the, this is the core of the sonic fractal matrix. So the thing I mentioned before of the possibility matrix, uh, expressed in <coughs> signal processing, that would mean that, or that the primary polarity is between novelty concrescence and conservation. So I just express that as on off. Mm -hmm. So that gives a nice binary corollary, right? We can go from one to zero, on to off, male to female, whatever binary that you need for that primary thing, that is what that represents. So in this, it represents on off. So it's a pulse. So in this conception, noise is the possibility matrix. It's the simultaneity of all sound, right? And so when it's, when it's going on and off, see? And the rate that it goes on and off is that exploration of novelty. Now, if you listen, you'll hear that the sound sounds like it's, when it's loud, it, it makes, I don't know, it makes the air in front of your nose go weird. It's like you've smoked a joint or something. It's like it's really, right? And that's because there is the secondary polarity after that is left and right. So then there is a polarity, same as there is the on-off. That's a kind of mono polarity. So it's just on-off, 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 right? Then there is left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right, back and forth. And then the third, um, the third polarity, which is the third dimension, is the high-low. So at some point, I'll get into uh, binaural processing because Pure Data does that pretty easily. But I felt like that was going to be an abstraction too far right now as my mind grafts itself around this type of synthesis. So uh, I used filters. So you hear the filters, the different, those different filters that you're hearing. And the reason why they sound like drums is because those relationships make them sound like drums. I didn't intend for them to sound like drums. And the more complexity that you add, the more, the more rain stick like it gets. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. I, it wasn't something I could plan. It was something that emerged. So I'll play that sound again. And the, and the, and the crackling sound is this thing. concept collapses down. That's why I keep using collapse down as, as the phrase, because uh, filters collapse down as a bandpass over a certain set of frequencies. And then you can move that bandpass to get to, to be able to change the frequency of that bandpass. Mm -hmm. So we're all still, anybody need to stretch their legs or All right, cool. So, um, so now this is a way that I've been looking at all of this lately so that as I develop the prosthetics that they make sense. Right now it's bulky. 
but the same kind of fractal interaction that I'm having with the software, like I make this sound, and then I tweak that until it pops to another level of novelty. And then I tweak that sound until it pops to another level of novelty, and on and on. So as this exploration happens, I need a system that allows me to increasingly wear this all the time. There's no, like, the information that, see, what this represents, this and this together, when it works, which it works now, and it'll work this evening, but it's not a really good representation of the idea of a self-programming hyperdimension. Because when you can hear your brain and you can use your hands simultaneously, your hands are directly, have, they, they have, um, there's a connection between your hands and your brain that is direct, right? There's a hand-brain connection, right? In fact, it's so profound that, that there was a, I forgot who made this quote because I had a bunch of them and I, you know, I remember the quotes, I just don't remember who made them, but that there is no such combination as, as dexterous hands and a clumsy mind. <laughs> that all of our investigations of music, art, science, everything is the dexterous interaction with our minds and our hands. This is the space, this is the, 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 the main space-time interface. It's the thing that makes the human human. Without hands, we are not human. We don't have those sections of the brain that process what this is capable of, and it has the highest amount of nerve endings in our fingertips of any other part of our body besides our brain. Mm. Really, we're a distributed thinking system. There's 500 million neurons in our stomach. Our feet have a, have a, have a, a, a particular role to play in, in, um, in our uh, interaction with space-time, and that's what the, um, those are the, um, these get sensors this week, the, the um, exo-feet, these are, uh, you can pass those around if you want. I don't know if anybody wants to touch them, you know, they're two years old. But um, these get sensors next week, so they're just measuring weight distribution. They'll be using the same type of polarity synthesis as the rest, right? So the thing that I'm really interested in bouncing off of you to get a feeling for, because I have a lot of talks and presentations I'm going to be doing this year, is... A, is an idea. We were born into the machine. It's like sometimes I wonder, you know, because you, if we can believe anything, then it's more useful and interesting to believe something useful and evolutionary, right? Yeah. We were born into the machine age. We were also born into machine music. We understand it. We don't even think about it. <coughs> of course I understand hip hop, or techno, or jazz, or funk, or any musics, but especially the electronic musics have changed. If speech changes the way our brains work, what do you think electronic dance music culture does to, to, to someone's brain? Yeah, ponder that the next time you smoke or do whatever psychedelic dalliance you may or may not do. We are programmed by this. Now, we can also, t we can also um, take control of our own programming using a kind of beat linguistic logic, right? That we take this understanding of rhythm, you see, Actually, watch this. So now, you listen to that long enough, you hear one thing now, and five minutes from now, you're hearing some other, some other mutation of pattern that's happening. And a little bit after that, and you don't, you stop, you, you start wondering, is it that the pattern is changing, or is my perception of the pattern changing? You see? And it's like that ability to change that pattern while the pattern is changing changes the way you process information 
I feel stronger. I don't know that. I'll know more in a year after I've programmed myself for a year. Um, this is the core sound of a logic that, well, since I'm unplugged, I can stand up now. This is the core sound of a logic that, um, oh, that's my EEG freaking out. Um, this is the core sound of a logic that, um, that can, let me just turn this off. That's a lot more interesting when there's actually something else going on, so I'm just gonna, okay. So, the thing is, the, the reason for, the reason for this interface is that each knuckle is a sensor. And they're all 3D printed. I designed this so that it could be 3D printed easily by someone who has no idea about any of this and put together with, it needs a soldering iron, you know, so that these little pieces that join things together can be melted so that they stay together. So it's little pieces of filament that are acting as the, as the um, what do you call it, the um, hinges, yeah. right? Um, it's made of three materials. There's a, an elastic material that allows it to be comfortable, so I have full dexterity, right? There is a nylon material so that when sensors need to be pushed, they can be pushed directly. You see, you can see that going up and down there, say like right here, right? And they can each be individually addressed, right? And there's a conductive material that creates the sensors. Let me see. Let's see if I can find, oh, I can do it with this one. Probably should have had a slide for this, but you know, whatever. Okay, well I won't take it completely off. See that little black disc in there? That is, that is uh, the, 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 um, the thing that's measured, the pin, is in the center. And the cathode is on the outside edge of the spiral. So that means that there is resistance built into the design and it presses against the anode. So that means that no matter how, it, that I can measure the pressure, but at the same time, it will never reach its full voltage. So that means I won't fry it, which was a big issue for the two years that it took me to figure out how to make that work. And that's the reason why I'm wearing dirty overalls under this, because I just, you know, I just had to just zoom in and figure this out. So now it's stable-ish, he says, ca he says cautiously before a concert tonight. Um, and the idea is that I've been working on systems for encoding that mathematical pattern that I told you about in the alphabet. That can be encoded as sound. Each of those pentatonic values can be encoded as sound. So I've been doing this since last year, and it works, but I needed to take some time off to make this work better. If, let's say for instance, my name's Onyx. So let's say that, oh, I forgot to mention the Metabit process, but I'll just go straight into this. That if I type Onyx and it's like, uh, O-N-O-N-Y-X, uh, right? <clears throat> if I play that back, because I am this adaptable, programmable being, I will understand that. The same way we under, when we hear, we can, we can remember melodies from our childhood way better than we can remember passages of text. If all of our reality gets funneled into this musical, we just take the letters, funnel them straight into sound, and that sound is what we remember. And we can, by we I mean me right now, can learn to remember information as sequences of sound using this beat logic. So there has to be something enjoyable about it. It can't just be like a modem, where it's like It can't be that. It's gotta be Once we understand the things that we are, like say for instance Facebook. I'm typing on Facebook, and I'll tell you how that works in a second. But I'm typing on Facebook. Each thing that I type, including emoticons, has a sound associated with it. Eventually, same way that we understand the logic, we understand the logic of, of ringtones and notification tones all day. We got it. Yes. So, are you, are you implying that eventually 
uh, evolution, whatever it is, that we can communicate via patterns of sound as opposed to speech patterns? I am right. suggesting that now that we live in the age of absurdity, which means that a year ago if I had said this, and I was working on this two years ago, and I know because I bounced this off people two years ago, and it was just kind of like nodding, like, oh, okay. And it wasn't as well developed, and this, wasn't, this didn't exist yet. Now, there is a reality TV show star as President of the United States. Looked at through a lens of evolution, and not through pathology, that means that all bets are off. All, any rules you want to make that can sustain themselves fractally can be implemented. It's all about constructing the concrescent idea. And if using this idea of a possibility matrix, or said another way that, or using different language, the universe using the universe, that's a thing. The universe loves novelty. The moment, any time the universe is presented with a choice between, ah, this is the safe way to do it, and this is the whew way to do it, all resources funnel into that direction. And then that, that concrescent exploration gets turned into this conservative thing, and then it becomes the simplicity that the next thing is built on. So what I'm saying is that I've already got the system working and we're implementing that joint right now. I think with enough crazy, I mean you can see it, I know I look crazy. I want to look crazy, why? Because when I look at, when I go on the internet and I look at all the people who have done stuff they all had that look. And they look at you, and you can see that they believe what they're saying. And you throw that in there, yeah. and you have a model that you can express. So if it's just yeah. crazy without a model, then you're just crazy and people stay away from you. When it's, when it's crazy, and you've got a model, and you can put that model on this global network to be shared through machines that can print it without you having to have a computer science degree or a mechanical engineering degree okay. or any of that stuff, right? Then that means that you can take properly constructed ideas and propagate them very, I mean, what was it, 2007, the iPhone dropped within eight months, everyone was carrying a, a, a supercomputer in their pocket. I carried, I carried pocket computers since the late 80s when they were Casios with little four-line displays on them. And that was not cool. That was not cool then. It was not cool at the birth of the internet. It was not cool in the early 2000s. But all of a sudden, Steve Jobs makes it with a, well, it was also the capacitive touchscreen that had 10 points of input and, and uh, GPS and all of these other features. But as soon as that properly expressed idea mm -hmm. dropped into this global network, it changed everything, right? And I also, in this investigation of the internet, there is the investigation of conspiracy theories, right? So, if you think through conspiracy theories properly, if you kind of look at them dispassionately, I don't believe or disbelieve, let's say this, the, the, the one that's the most, that's the favorite on the internet, the Illuminati. <laughs> no Illuminati that is not retarded, that's trying to control the minds of everyone would allow everyone to have supercomputers that are growing exponentially in processing power in their pockets. That's just that, that wouldn't make any sense. There wouldn't be open source APIs for artificial intelligence. That was supposed to be the magic thing that the people in the 1984 big, you know, Nazi box were supposed to control and we were supposed to all walk around with like drones. No. You can download that and program it yourself. And there's some 15-year-old kid who has a YouTube channel with two million subscribers who will teach it to you. And they're an expert at it. Bitcoin was not part of the grand new world order plan. That's emergent. Yes? What it feels like to me is that you're making some good valid points, but it's like there's a lot and I'm not seeing the connection 
what it is that you're trying to get at. What I'm looking at is if I'm processing my entire reality right now through this programming language of linear uh, conceptualization born of the English language, of this of a programming language that's meant for programming. We create words, we imbue those words with meaning, and then we deploy them and hope that we have a common dictionary so that we understand each other. Like a universal language? I, well, English, I wouldn't say it's universal. I would say that it is, that it is um, granular in its ability to create meaning. You know, we can just make up a word and we can choose. If I say, man, that's bigly, my body language will tell you that I'm, in, I'm implying that bigly is something not quite cool. If I say, man, that was bigly, you see, I'm saying that I'm excited and that this word bigly is my reference word for that thing, right? But bigly doesn't have a rhythm component. It doesn't have any kind of cymatics other than the meaning of the word itself. I'm not saying bigly. We don't have the thing where we're using our voice like this. I think we would understand each other better. You see what I'm saying? We don't have clicks. We don't have pops. We don't have a thing. Imagine if everything you said had a layer, a dimension. So you're trying to create a new language. Well, I'm programming myself to conceptualize such a thing. And that at a certain point, it should be a thing where when you witness it as someone who does not engage in this, that you're like, okay, that makes, that makes, okay, that makes sense. You see, I have to understand it first, so I have to program me, you see. So I'm, that's why I say it's like I'm sharing that process of how I'm going about pro programming myself. I don't think, I, I, there was a time when I was detaching from the English language because it always seemed like the more you talk about something, the less gets done. People sit around, talk, 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 talk. And it's only when the actual do, it's, it's good for programming actions if your language and, and the language that you're using allows for it. So if you have a language and it's grafted onto an engineering, you know, dialect, a, a botanical dialect, a, you know, some type of dialect that gets down to specifics so that your talking actually produces something in space time, cool. But I feel like there is a missed opportunity. We're, think about it, we're all walking around with cybernetic, with this whole other sense in our pocket that is connected globally. It has any kind of audio we want to have surround sound, uh, stereo, mono, uh, binaural, anything, right? We can stick it next to our face and now we can look around in an artificial environment. It's all right there, right? So how best, now do you think that it's the Terminator vision is the best way to go about in, uh, integrating in this space-time global network construct that's not getting any less weird that we need to have more text? I don't think so. I think the text is, is is good. It's like you don't like if you had to change the had, had to change JavaScript every time you got on Facebook, nobody would use Facebook. So a programming language is good for getting that up. But then there has to be that natural thing that you can step into that you just are, right? Once you have that, right, you have this ability that, see, one of the things, for instance, here's a good example. How much time do I have? Did you know? About five minutes. Five minutes, okay, let me try to see if I can, if I can do like, did you ever see that uh, sci-fi show Caprica? Yeah, they, they, they canceled the show, and then they tried to wrap up two seasons worth of stuff in like a five minute thing, so that's what I'm trying to do right now. But uh, it's like, Google, completely screwed up with this. This, as memory augmentation, is perfect. What I should be able to do is look at you, go like this, get you to say your name, or I say your name. And then, while I'm going about my day, every once in a while, 
bling, that guy. And it's like, oh, that's uh, Adam. Oh, no, that's Charles. Swipe. Oh, uh, what is the Python function for blah, blah, blah? It's that thing. I don't, it doesn't have to show up. I just have to remember it in my mind. Oh, I got it. Boom. Now, in the rotation of things that are popping up in that little screen, some things stop showing up very often, some things show up more often to have memory augmentation, right? So now when you think about that in a loop, that's temporal loops. Uh, a, a, a way of interacting with temporal loops that we actually do and understand very well is electric music. We already understand temporal loops. So imagine you've got a thing you've got to do on Thursday, and you've got, you want to be reminded, I've got to do this thing at 2 o'clock on Tuesday, and there is, you're at the center of a clock. This is 12 o'clock. One, two, three, four, five, six, and on the round, right? Now I gotta do that thing at seven o'clock, right? And every, let's say, the two days ahead of time, I just get a, and it sounds like it's in the distance. And I hear that loop, and that loop is, da -da -da -da. you know, like I said, like I understand my name, Onyx. I'll understand a whole, I understand a whole bunch of stuff now, but I understand that thing little sounds for, for, for punctuation, all of those things, it happens. And then as it gets closer, it happens, it happens more often, more often. And just without even having to think about it, because eventually you stop hearing all of this, it just becomes another dimension of perception. And you just know these things, or you just at that place. This type of interaction, that's the personal. Then when you interact with other people who are also interacting with the system, we have this, where we can talk, but then we have this whole other thing. I haven't even told you about the cryptocurrency aspect of being able to, to uh, I designed this to be able to shake hands, and because each of these can be a sensor, with NFC tags, all this kind of stuff, you can do, that's a, that, can, that can sign a smart contract. You see, once you wear the data and you understand it as sound, then everything becomes that. The, the according to Marshall McLuhan, and I agree with his uh, conjecture that we live in an acoustic age. All information is acoustic. We're not living in a, 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 a print-mediated age anymore, even though we're still reading it. Information on the internet doesn't come from a single place. It, it expresses itself more like sound. So the more that our information technologies express themselves as sound, in a literal sense and a figurative sense, the more we will understand and be able to explore novelty as we go forward into an increasingly novel uh, space-time uh, experience.